Hi, welcome everybody. Um, this is the second speaker series um, for the month of Pride. Today we are joined by Wilson Cruz um, and Lauren Custer Downey. Dow Dowling, my name. Uh, Wilson is a GLAD national spokesperson as well as um, representative and advocate. And uh, you've also probably seen him in shows like Ally McBeal, Grey's Anatomy, and On Rent. So without further ado, Wilson Cruz, please. Okay, I don't need to look at that all day. Hi, how are you? Thanks so much for coming out and um, joining us here in the room. Um, I understand there's lots of people watching, or hopefully lots of people watching from their desks here on campus at the Googleplex. Um, so welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. And, um, and thank you for having me here today. I'm, I'm actually really proud to be here to speak to all of you um, and to meet all of you. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing for me, who's not very technical, technologically advanced to be um, on the, the campus of Google. I mean, I can barely turn the computer on. So, uh, But I do have an app that I would like to pitch for you today. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, how many times do you guys get to hear that when somebody comes and visits? Um, I am a disruptor, but I am a, a completely different kind of disruptor. Um, I am very proud to be here um, during Pride Month. But for me and everyone at GLAAD, which is um, where I work and um, the organization that I represent, every day is Pride Month. Um, every, every day is Pride Day. Um, and for almost 30 years, uh, GLAD has been using the stories in the media to shape the narrative and to provoke dialogue about LGBT equality so that everyone, no matter who you are or where you are, can live the life that you love. Um, first, I'd like to ask, is there anyone here, uh, by a show of hands, who identifies as L, G, B, or T, or, or Q for questioning, yeah? Oh, nice, big, lots of, most of the people in the room, for those of you know, uh, who are watching from your desks. Um, is there anyone here who identifies as an ally? Thank you very much, we would be nowhere without you. Um, um, but you know, if you, have, if you did not raise your hand, no pressure, but actually pressure. Pressure first uh, to be inclusive of our entire community, and second, because part of the idea of Pride Month is um, about being out and open about who you are and what you represent. Um, for anyone that's feeling a little bit uh, shy or not sure if it's safe to identify as LGBT or, or even as an LGBT ally here today, I hope that um, by the time we finish here today, I have been able to um, convince you otherwise, that it, this really is a safe place. Um, that's what I do at my job every day at GLAD. Um, but really, it's been my life's work. Um, it really has been my life. Um, because at GLAD, it's always personal. Um, my relationship with this organization started almost 20 years ago. Um, I know you're thinking, <laughs> you're barely 20 yourself. Um, but no, alas, I am not. Um, it actually started 20 years ago, um, around 1995, when I had the pleasure of accepting um, the outstanding um, drama series GLAAD Media Award for my very first television series, My So-Called Life. Um, for those of you who may, have not, who may have not watched it by now, um, I played the very first gay teenager on primetime television, uh, Ricky Vasquez. And it was through this experience on My So-Called Life that I witnessed the power of how media can uh, affect change. Um, I saw how one story, my story really, um, if handled responsibly and accurately, could change perspectives and lives. Um, people, be people came to know Ricky and to love him um, because finally there was a story of a young person um, on a journey of self-discovery and of self-acceptance that was being told honestly. Um, and viewers grew to understand him and to love him because of this. And among those viewers was my very own father. Um, you see, just a few months before we actually started filming the series, um, I came out to my own dad, um, and it did not go well. He actually kicked me out of my house um, because I told him that I was gay. Um, and we did not speak for almost a year. Um, but he broke his silence um, when he turned on the television one day and watched an episode of My So-Called Life in which my character, Ricky, um, was thrown out of his own home and beaten because he had come out to his family. 
Um, my father watched that episode and afterwards picked up the phone and said that he wanted me to come home uh, to talk. So through the years when I've received letters from young people or I've met people who were affected by that show who said that Ricky uh, saved their lives or helped them to be able to speak to their parents about who they really are, um, I could tell them that I honestly understood what they meant by that because Ricky did that for me as well. Um, that's the power of storytelling. And I've, ex I've experienced it over and over again in my career. Uh, whether it was playing Ricky Vasquez or Angel in Rent uh, on Broadway or playing Dr. Junito Vargas on Noah's Ark on the Logo series at Noah's Ark. Um, these were both gay characters living with HIV. I've learned that stories like these serve as not only entertainment but as vessels of empathy which can lead to acceptance. Those are the opportunities that I've always looked for as an actor. They've been um, the most satisfying and gratifying experiences of my life. Um, to be able to not only do what I love um, and, and also be able to inform people about what our lives are really like. Um, that to me is a, mar is a perfect marriage and it's the perfect experience for me. Um, and many people throughout my career for the last 20 years um, are, always, are always asking me if I'm afraid of being typecast uh, in just gay roles. And I hate that question, I really do. I you know, later on we're gonna do a Q&A and, um, and, and I'll answer any question, but that question always gets to me because I'm always like, well, you know, do you think that they ask like Brad Pitt or Ryan Gosling or George Clooney if they're afraid of being typecast in straight roles? No, they don't ask them that. Um, you know, it's, you know, being straight or gay doesn't define a character to me. It's just an aspect of who that person is. It's, it's, it's incredible to me that they think just because um, you're playing a gay character that he's just like every other gay character you've ever played. Um, but LGBT people are varied and complicated. Every character I've played has been an individual and everyone has been different for me and has helped me uh, illuminate what it means to be a queer person in the world. Uh, whether it was an, an ambitious political operative on the West Wing or the nanny for the youngest Salinger child on Party of Five or a man doing all he could to make his domestic partnership ceremony in Seattle feel as special as a wedding on Grey's Anatomy. I've worked to make these people and their experiences real and honest and as complicated as all of us are. And I'm proud to say that I continue to be fortunate enough to be given that opportunity um, to, to be an actor who tells the stories of our community. And today, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm very proud to say that is, uh, today is the DVD release of a film that, that I was proud to do with Lucas Haas called Meth Head. Um, which takes a look at the effects of meth addiction in our community and how it affected this gay couple. Um, I've, I've seen um, how devastating that drug has been to our community and I think the film does a, a, a really great job of depicting what that's, been, what, what that's like for a lot of people. Um, and this fall, I'll be part of um, one of the most anticipated new series to come to television on Fox called The Red Band Society, uh, where I'll be playing a nurse um, alongside Oscar winner Octavia Spencer. Um, um, it takes place in the pediatric ward of a hospital um, as we help uh, guide the lives of, of a group of young people who live in that pediatric ward um, and we help them through this very difficult time and, and they create a bond and they create this society they call The Red Band Society because once you have your first surgery, they all get a red band. Um, and the show itself will actually include um, a many LGBT act, uh, characters, including, uh, including mine, um, who has a very odd name, Kenji Gomez Rejon. Do I look like a Kenji? Um, but I'll take it. Uh, these are the kinds of stories uh, I came to GLAAD to tell. Uh, I wanted to help GLAAD advocate for not just more representation in the media, but a diversity in that representation of LGBT people and experiences and a more diverse view of who we are. GLAAD's work is comprehensive in scope um, and affects every aspect of an LGBT person's life. We work every day 
to ensure that everyone knows the truth about who we really are and that they feel and understand that we are an integral part of the global family with the same hopes and dreams and aspirations as everyone else. And lately we've had some astounding successes and a lot of that has a lot to do with you and people like you. Um, and I'll explain those triumphs in, in detail. But first, let me give you a little background on what the state of LGBT equality is in America right now and tell you what our goals are. Um, we've clearly come a long way. Uh, it's a good time to be out in America. Last year, our nation made a huge step forward uh, when the Supreme Court dismissed DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, and decided that California's Prop 8 was unconstitutional. And um, props to all of you who fought against Prop 8. That was a long, long fought battle, a long hard fought battle. I think it was really the, 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 the moment that really um, pushed our, gen or uh, this younger generation, this y XY generation, to really get involved um, and really um, made it real for them that this wasn't something that was just going to happen automatically, but it was something that we were going to have to uh, advocate for and fight for. Um, so I'm very proud of um, the state of California and everyone who worked so hard to make that happen. And because of that, uh, marriage equality is now legal in 19 states. And every morning I have to wake up and I have to figure out if that's still true because it's happening so fast. All of us at, at, um, at GLAD, sometimes we have these posters in our offices and we like have to mark very happily the, the number off and replace it with the number 19 or 20, hopefully soon. Um, and GLAD and other organizations are on the ground in, in the other 31 states to make sure that anyone can get married to whomever they love in any state. We still have our struggles um, on the legal front and the cultural front, but we're on our way. America is also becoming safer for LGBT students since bullying has become a national issue. Yet still today, eight out of 10 students report being verbally harassed for being gay. Glad to help engage Youth Project, better known as Hey, or Hey, um, Spirit Day, <laughs> and uh, GLSEN, which is the Gay and Lesbian Straight Educators Network's Safe Schools program, are all making a difference so that kids can go to school in safe and accepting environments. And we don't just mean safe and accepting by the, accepted by their peers, but by their educators and administrators too. The sports world has also taken miraculous leaps in the past year or two. Athletes like Michael Sam, Jason Collins, and Brittany Griner will go down in history for breaking through the AstroTurf ceiling. Is that a thing? The AstroTurf ceiling? No, it's not? Okay. Um, does that exist? That'd be kind of cool when you think about it. Um, but anyway, what GLAD does is work, we work very closely with many athletes, um, including those three that I just mentioned, um, on helping them shape the narrative of their public coming out stories and to encourage the media to cover those stories in a fair and non-salacious way. And now kids, little kids all over this country can play t-ball and powder puff football and know that they can succeed and that who they are won't impede, won't impede them from achieving their dreams. And who knew that the 2014 Olympics would turn out to be such a hot, bu uh, such a hot button issue for LGBT rights and protections around the globe, but it did. You could not hear the name Sochi without thinking about the safety and rights of LGBT athletes and people in Russia and around the world. And that's because of GLAD's work with activists living in Russia, with news outlets and athletes themselves to get the message of equality and acceptance out there. GLAD's focus since the start has always been on media because we know what a powerful force it is in shaping opinions and changing hearts and minds. When people know us, when they know our story, when they feel that we've been in their home on their television sets and they've welcomed us in, in order to share a piece of who we are. They feel like we're part of their society and their families. And when they walk into those voting booths, they vote with us more often than not when that is the case. And that's why GLAD focuses so much on the media. That's why our work really revolves around it. For example, trans uh, transgender actress and activist and my friend Laverne Cox on the cover of Time just a few weeks ago is a huge deal. For many people, Laverne Cox is the first transgender person that they know. 
and her story is powerful and it's changing the way that people see transgender people and understand their experience. Um, and it seems like every day some LGBT actor or executive is coming out like it's no big deal. And that's because it isn't. And it isn't anymore because of people like you. And while LGBT people have had huge successes in terms of representation on TV shows and in films and in news coverage of uh, the stories and issues that matter to us, we still have a ways to go. Um, and that's a priority for GLAD right now. But Media Watchdog is just a small part of what we do. Um, other priorities for GLAD right now, workplace protections for LGBT people, which just happened to be in the news yesterday, as I'm sure many of you heard. Just yesterday, our president, President Obama, um, announced that he is expected to sign an executive order that would ban workplace discrimination against LGBT employees of federal contractors. It's a huge, huge step. And we're very grateful to the president and his administration for making that um, step. But we're still waiting for both houses of Congress to pass the Employee Non-Discrimination Act, or ENDA, because today, and even after uh, the president signs this, um, this executive order, if you are not a federal employee, it will be legal for you to be fired in 29 states if you are gay and 32 states if you are a transgender person in this country. So while we celebrate the president's announcement, we know that there's a lot of work to be done even afterwards. Um, and speaking of transgender people, uh, transgender rights are incredibly important to GLAD because did you know that 41% of transgender people report attempting suicide compared with just 1.6 of the general population? 41%. That doesn't mean that transgender people are more likely because of who they are to attempt suicide. That means that their lives are made so difficult because of the way that our society is that that seems like a way to go. That has to change. And that's why the stories of Laverne Cox and people who come out as transgender and tell their stories are so important. And that's why GLAD is so committed to telling those stories. Um, there's still so much misinformation and misunderstanding about trans people. And GLAD knows this is a priority. And it's not just talking to the greater society about trans people, but it's also talking about it within our own community. We still, within our own community, have so much to learn. Hi, water. Um, there's still, even within our community, so much work to do um, in the way that we talk to each other and understand each other and our lives. Um, so we're committed to doing that work, not only um, with, uh, you know, outside of our community, but within it. Um, we're also working to become more connected with LGBT communities outside of the United States. Um, you know how bad things are in Russia, in Uganda, in Brunei, in Nigeria, parts of the Middle East and other countries where being gay can and is a death sentence. We want to take what we've learned from our work on the ground here at home in the last 30 years and bring it to other activists around the world. It's all a part of GLAD's new Global Voices program, which we launched with the Olympics. And also here at home, we're continuing to make it a priority to connect with that larger global world with, with our Spanish language and Latino media programs and people of color, especially meaningful to me because, well, hello. Um, but Seriously, GLAD is the only national LGBT organization with a Spanish language program. GLAD identified early on that this, is, that this growing population would be integral to our movement, and the changes we've seen in the last 10 years alone are staggering. You can see the effects of our work from the way that our news stories are covered on Spanish language networks like Univision and Telemundo, and even in novelas and television series. All of this made possible by the hard work of our Spanish language media department, which I'd like to tell you consists of two people. Um, and they are hard working and they get it done. Um, part of the, their, their most recent work is a PSA that we've put together um, in that, that is um, targeting the World Cup. And so please keep an, keep an eye out for it because um, I'm in it. Um, <laughs> I mean, who else? Uh, <laughs> But um, it's actually a really exciting time to be at GLAD. Um, I've been with the organization on staff for
for two years now, almost two years now. And um, before that, I used to be on the board, and I've hosted the GLAD Media Awards a couple of times. I have a couple of GLAD Media Awards myself. Um, but I'm especially, especially excited about being at GLAD right now in this moment, because just this January, we welcomed our new president, Sarah Kate Ellis, um, who we welcomed uh, from the media world. And um, I have such huge respect for this woman. She, um, she, get this, is a lesbian married to a rock musician, yes, um, and she and her wife got pregnant on the very same day. It's bananas, okay? They have five-year-old twins, a girl and a boy, who are not technically twins. That's their college essay right there. Wrap it up, <laughs> okay? Um, but under Sarah Kate, along with much input from GLAD's board of directors and yours truly, we are taking a three-pronged approach to the issues as we move ahead. Um, GLAD's goals right now are three-pronged. Are three educate, advocate, and to protect. We're educating our fellow Americans on LGBT issues through TV, film, and social media. We're advocating for LGBT people who are all too often unprotected or underserved. That includes LGBT kids facing bias in schools, LGBT couples who want to get married, or LGBT employees facing discrimination in the workplace. And with our new Southern Stories program, we'll be focusing more and more on our brothers and sisters, uh, our LGBT brothers and sisters in the South, where clearly we still have so much work left to be done. Um, GLAD is protecting the advances also. Um, we've made recently and over the past three decades as anti-gay groups push hard to create new roadblocks to equality so that they can keep their doors open. Um, but this is no time to let our foot up off the gas. This is the time to push forward and to realize the dream. And, and I, I try to remind people that, you know, there was a, there was a point in 1973 when Roe versus Wade was, uh, was um, decided on by the Supreme Court. And, um, and we thought, you know, the, the conversation about abortion was over. The conversation f about abortion had just started. Um, and that um, community who um, wanted their right to, choo uh, to choose um, may have put, taken their foot off the gas. Um, and because of that, we started to see a lot of eroding of those rights um, as years passed. And so what we at GLAD believe is now that we're starting to see such success, we're starting to see such advances in LGBT equality, um, part of our job is to make sure that we keep those rights and that those laws stay in, um, in place and, and intact. And so it really is about protecting um, those rights. And part of that, and a large part of that, is ha continuing to have conversations with the American people um, and citizens of the world about why these rights are important. Um, so you will not see GLAD or the LGBT movement take its foot off of the gas. We are pushing forward um, and we're going to realize the dream. Um, and yes, part of my work at GLAD includes hanging out with huge celebrities. It's very difficult at the GLAD Media Awards, but you know, it's the hardest part of my job, chilling with J-Lo and Ricky Martin and Anderson Cooper and Madonna, but I do what I have to do. Um, and in fact, this year, uh, GLAD was very proud to celebrate 25 years of the GLAD Media Awards. And lest you think it's all champagne drinking, the power of the awards reaches folks all over the world. Uh, they've become a platform for celebrities and notables to take a stand for LGBT equality and come out as allies. And I brought a video so that you can take a look um, at what it's been like uh, for the GLAD Media Awards in the last 25 years. Look, I'm doing this. You should be very impressed. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's the most impressive thing I've done yet. Is this?
I know, no comments on the hair. Okay, it was 1995, thank you. Um, and yes, the earring was very in at the time, so I wanna hear nothing from any of y'all about that. Um, do I turn it off, what do I do? My hero, thank you. Um, but you can see that the media awards, you know, while very glamorous and glittery and we all get dressed up and we have um, a great time, is really about the fact that a lot of those moments that you saw in that video clip went viral. You know, they, they weren't just for the people in that room. They were for people who were um, allowed to watch those moments and hear from people that they recognized and respected um, and could relate to. And those people, um, by being there and showing their commitment to LGBT people, gave permission to everyone who saw them do those things and say those things to also be allies and also feel comfortable with who they are. And that's powerful. Um, you know, we get accused of being celebrity driven. We're not celebrity driven. What we are is people driven. And we want people to know and to feel that they're supported by the entire country. And some of those people are very famous people who we respect um, and we hold up in our, in our community. Um, it's very powerful uh, when we think about what somebody like Elizabeth Taylor was able to do for our movement um, and, and the lives that she's saved. Um, and she continues to save even today through her foundation. So um, I'm very proud of the, of the GLAAD Media Awards. And it's also a time for us to look at the media um, in you know, the year in the media and say, these are the kinds of representations of uh, or characters or news stories that we want the media to do more of. Um, it's a way for us to hold them accountable. It's a way for us to say thank you for telling our story and for driving forward the conversation for LGBT equality. Um, so I, I, it kills me every time when I see that video because I think when you look at it and you realize it's been 25 years and you think about where we were 25 years ago, um, make no mistake that so much of that happened because of the media awards and because of GLAAD and, um, and I'm very proud of, of being a part of this organization. Um, but um, you know, our work today is also in the boardrooms and corporate communications departments in America because let's face it, corporate America can shape the narrative and move mountains from Capitol Hill to lunchrooms and water coolers. Um, you know, I spoke about the changes in the sports world, but corporate America is also coming out of the closet uh, for equality through internal policies, external actions, and gatherings like this. And that's why when anti-LGBT laws come up in places like Arizona, like they did earlier this year, um, which would have given uh, businesses the ability to turn away LGBT people uh, just because of who they are, we worked behind the scenes to advocate that national corporations and even sports leagues spoke out against it. We also worked with national media to make sure that the story was being told accurately um, and to combat some of the misinformation that our opponents were putting out there. Um, one of the companies that is a leader in taking a stand for this community, for our community, is Google and has been Google um, for a long time. Um, the tech world is progressive by nature and you understand the power of communication and how to create the platforms we need in order to reach people and to reach them with this message. I, I don't think I'm blowing smoke up uh, your butts when I say that the work Google has done over the past couple of years has offered tremendous opportunities for LGBT equality. Last year, Google was one of hundreds of companies to file a brief with the Supreme Court arguing that federal same-sex marriage restrictions hurt their businesses. But that was just one search result in the dozens of search results when you research Google and LGBT issues. Um, some of that we've done in conjunction with you, and some you've done all by your own, your, yourself. To name a few, um, your Olympic doodles and Valentine's Day doodles, including same-sex couples, was right in line with the majority of Americans who believe in diversity and marriage equality. Second, when you launched Google+, users were initially required to make their gender designations public. Some trans and gender non-conforming users did not love that. So Google+, Plus actually became the first social media platform to expand their gender feel and tailor privacy settings. 
Next, together with GLAAD, Google coordinated Google Plus Hangouts about World AIDS Day, the amazing documentary, How to Survive a Plague, which if you haven't seen, you must see it, um, and also to discuss with interested parties what might happen for marriage equality in all states, Utah, um, which still boggles my mind, and I'm, I thought that was the last one we were gonna get, honestly. Um, but Google Hangouts have also, created, uh, have also been created by your team and with GLAAD to discuss what's next for marriage equality and transgender issues. Then, Google Chrome rolled out an It, get an it Gets Better uh, ad during Glee, an amazing ad. It was actually nominated for a GLAAD Advertising Award and made history as being one of the first national TV commercials about an LGBT issue. Also, the Google Zeitgeist, Here's to 2013 ad, was smart enough to include images of LGBT equality, including Cassidy Lynn Campbell, one of, the, one of um, our country's first trans high school students to be named homecoming queen, uh, openly gay NBA athlete Jason Collins, um, marriage equality and champion of equality Nelson Mandela. Um, Glad was also delighted to work with Google on last year's Proud to Love campaign on Google Plus and YouTube. Uh, we were looking for documented moments of love related to the LGBT community, whether it be self-love or family love, romantic love, community love, you name it. Um, then we took those images and posted photos on Google Plus or uploaded videos to YouTube. The GLAAD staff, everyone, uh, took the challenge, and I have to say mine is particularly cute, so you should go ahead and look for that because it's, it's worth seeing. Um, for Pride Month this year, shut up, Lauren. For Pride Month this year, <laughs> We've teamed up again for the follow-up to that campaign, Proud to Play. Right now, LGBT athletes like Jason Collins, Robbie Rogers, Brittany Griner, Darren Young, and more are proud to play a role in YouTube's newest LGBT Pride campaign. Glad worked with Raymond Braun of Google and YouTube to connect with athletes, LGBT sports groups, and to promote the campaign. The campaign honors LGBT athletes, their supporters, as well as the YouTube creators who stand up for diversity in sports and elsewhere. And as part of the campaign, YouTube's logo, seen by tens of millions of people every day, features a rainbow soccer ball and leads visitors to the Proud to Play channel, which showcases videos of LGBT athletes and allies speaking out in support of equality on the field. Even the Google homepage paid homage to Proud to Play driving Googlers from across the world to the Proud to Play channel. So you have a lot to be proud of um, as a, a member of the Google team. Um, you guys are doing great, great work um, in order to facilitate the conversation. That's the kind of impact you're having on LGBT people and allies all over the world. But you're also making a difference between these walls, this workplace with your LGBT policies. First of all, you've got a workplace policy for LGBT employees and you stand behind it. Google offered increased health benefits for trans employees starting in 2011. And I know you work hard to bring diversity to employee ranks and encourage LGBT hires. I also hear you've got an incredible LGBT employee resource group, the Gaglers. Um, I know you don't just celebrate pride, but you inform other employees about programs and policies to keep this company fair and inclusive. Um, some Google employees even went out uh, to support marriage equality with a really incredible and moving ad called The Four. Uh, it speaks to both the pride of the employees who appeared in it and the company that supported you in making it. So, what can you do to make this spirit of pride and inclusion going, to keep it going? Um, what can you do to bring others in? Well, as we all know, it's not just policy, but culture at the company that matters. So you can be sure to do things like participate in Spirit Day this fall on October 16th, uh, when we'll all go purple in a stand against LGBT bullying in a national day of support for LGBT young people. It's, it's the one day a year that the whole country comes together by wearing purple, by turning their faith, their social media um, profiles purple, in order to say that LGBT youth should feel safe wherever they are. Um, you can wear purple, you can turn your online profiles purple, you can eat eggplant if that's what you want to do, um, but we work with everyone. 
We work with uh, the White House, with Oprah, with the NBA, with PepsiCo, Times Square, the Today Show, to local schools in Wisconsin and parishes in the South. Um, MTV last year changed its logo to purple and so did all of the major league baseball teams. Um, we also had every single sports uh, organization down to NASCAR turn purple last year. Um, lots of organizations will be doing some incredible LGBT programming on October 16th, Spirit Day. So, you know, to find out more, you can just Google it. Um, for those of you who identify as LGBT, um, you need to continue to be out and proud among your colleagues and fellow employees. Talk about your home life. Put pictures on your desk of the people you love. They're called printed photos. They go in little frames. They don't have to be just on your little phone where nobody sees them. People need to, you can share your life with people. Um, it's very 20th century to have a, a, a photo on your desk. Um, you can um, continue to be visible here at Google and in real life. Other people will take your stories and attitudes with them uh, take, take them home with them, and who knows what kinds of minds you will be changing. Who knows if the mom next to you, in the cube next to you, has a gay child at home and that is dying to come out and wants to feel comfortable doing that. She can be affected by the people that she's met here at work. Um, who knows if there's a coworker um, who wants to respond to some discriminating or careless words he heard on a conference call. Um, you can help him do that. Um, you can continue to represent your company and personal values of inclusion, diversity, and equality, and you can't go wrong just by doing that. And of course, I encourage everyone here to get involved with GLAAD. We um, have some amazing programs that uh, you can be a part of. I've mentioned some, some of them today, but we also have our San Francisco Gala, which um, takes place this year on September 13th uh, at the San Francisco Hilton in Union Square. Um, and this year, we're really changing it up. Um, it's really about the people who are moving our movement forward. Um, and we're honoring some in incredibly um, impressive and um, people who, who have taken our movement to the next level. And a lot of that is happening here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and we want to recognize this community for the power that they bring to the movement. Um, so I encourage you all to attend it. Uh, to tell your friends to come to it. Um, it's, it's a new kind of event for GLAAD, um, and it's really specific and special to the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm, I'm actually really very excited about it. Um, so you can also get on our Twitter feed. Am I allowed to say Twitter here? Is that okay? No? no? Okay. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. How about that? You can, you can sign up for our YouTube channel. Uh, you can follow us on Google+. Plus. Um, uh, you can send us your stories um, and your feedback because we want to know how you feel about the work that we're doing and we want your input on how we can do it better. Um, you, can go, you can share your stories, your personal stories, by going to glad.org slash share your story. Um, that's what GLAD stands for today, sharing your stories, shaping the cultural narrative, and helping you and your friends and the people you love live the life that they love. Um, I want to thank you personally for having me here today. Um, I'm very proud to celebrate you, to celebrate Google, to celebrate the relationship that Google and GLAAD have worked so hard to create in the last few years. Um, and that relationship is truly changing the world. Um, so thank you. And I'm going to take some questions now. So did you need to move the camera? God forbid I do anything off camera. Is it on? No. And honestly, um, I am not shy. I, I've probably answered every conceivable question you can come up with, so feel free. I, um, we can talk about GLAAD, we can talk about you know, my career, we can talk about where we are in the movement, we can talk about Google. Who's going to be first?
So her question um, was to go into a little bit more depth about how GLAD is doing its international work, um, right? Um, mainly because um, in so many of these countries, if we're talking about countries like Brunei or Russia or the Middle East, um, uh, more visibility can actually be very dangerous, right? So what we're, what we're committed to doing is actually working with people who are already working as activists in those countries um, and reinforcing them and the work that they're doing. Um, a lot of these um, uh, people on the ground um, around the world um, are doing, are, are, are creating actions and, um, and, and they're doing what they can, at, at how they can, right? So we're going in and giving them um, the, the wealth of our own experience and knowledge, how we started here 30 years ago. Um, and we're also coming in with a lot of media experience, how to engage their local media. Um, we're not recruiting for them. What we are doing is asking them what it is that they need, what it is that they, they feel they need help with on the ground, um, as far as uh, how do they talk to their, um, to their local media, to their national media, um, what access they have to it, how to start the conversations with those media outlets, um, for instance, when um, this whole thing blew up in Russia with these anti-gay laws that, that were passed there, um, we actually, along with um, uh, other organizations, brought out a number of LGBT activists who had been working on the ground, um, and we brought them here to the States before the Olympics, like months before, um, so that they could meet people here who were influencers um, and who had experience early on in the movement. Um, in order for them to, to get advice on how to go about the work that they were doing on the ground. Um, we're also giving them, um, what do you, you know, we're amplifying their voices in American media because so much of the media, is this thing on? So much of the media in their own countries aren't, um, aren't giving them the space that they need or deserve. So. Um, what we're doing is we're giving, we're getting them uh, the bullhorn here in, in the United States um, in American media, knowing that the media here in the States um, is spread out across the world. So um, we're shedding a light on, on what's happening there, knowing that it will boomerang back, um, even if it's just through uh, the internet. So. Um, it's really about reinforcing them, um, giving them the ability to do their work better, um, and training them on how to use the media um, locally. And we're really sticking to our, that's, that's, that's our home, right? You know, how, how, do you, how do you amplify your message? How do you um, get as many eyes and ears uh, to the story that you want told? And that's, that's, that's the role we see ourselves playing. And that's what, what we've learned how to do best. Um, but you're right. I think, part, I think you're right in the sense that um, it is dangerous. But we have to remember that 40 years ago, 50 years ago, it was dangerous here. Um, and we wouldn't be here today if um, there weren't people who were willing to risk their lives um, so that we could get here today. And the people we're meeting in places like Russia, uh, in China, um, in the Middle East, know that they're putting themselves in danger. Um, I think our job as a media advocacy organization is to shed a big spotlight on them. Um, you know, just at the Media Awards this past year, um, we, we gave out our very first Advocate for Change Award, uh, which is a, a global award. And we gave it to Manny Daguerre, who um, is the head of the um, LGBT film festival in Russia. And she really is starting a conversation there. And, um, and you know, we, along with um, Dustin Lance Black and with Bruce Cohen, who went out there, and Gus Van Sant, um, they really put a big spotlight on those issues at the time of their film festival. Um, and they put themselves in danger. I mean, there were, there were bomb threats at the time, and um, we celebrated her, hoping that 
by people hearing her story and hearing her struggle, um, that there would be more and more um, global pressure uh, put on the government of Russia to change their laws. Does that answer your question? Hi. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we have been doing. Um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So um, the, question, the question was, does GLAAD um, have a place, uh, a, a part to play in helping bridge a divide that seems to be um, being created in our own community in regards to um, language, right, as far as language um, in reference to trans people um, there seems to be two um, schools of thought. Um, and really, that, uh, there is, a, there is a, a place for GLAAD to play, and we've been playing it, which is um, how do we manage to have this conversation uh, without tearing each other apart um, and um, a lot of, uh, I have, it, this, it's, it's, it's been very frustrating, I have to be honest with you, because I've, I've been working a lot on this with the communications team and the programs team. Um, I can tell you how I feel about it personally. And, and I, think I, can, I think I speak for um, our staff as well, which is I'm not a trans person. So um, I have to defer to trans people when they tell me how they want to be re referred to. Um, it is not my place as a gay man to say that I have the right to use a particular word in reference to trans people. Um, I look at it as if I had a brother or a sister uh, and they came to me and they said, you know, when you use that word, it offends me. As, my bro as their brother, I would stop immediately because I love them, because they're part of my family. I don't understand what it is that people are robbed from. I, I don't understand what, they're ro what people are robbed um, when they are asked to respect people uh, to the point where, um, to respect people in the way that they want to be um, referred to. Um, have, had, I, had I used the word, the T word in, in the past before I was educated about it? Absolutely, I thought it was a funny word. Now that I know differently, I do differently. Um, you know, Maya Angelou died just a couple of weeks ago and that was, that was her biggest lesson for me. You know, I am allowed to make mistakes, but once I am educated enough to know that I made a mistake, it's my job to learn that lesson and change my actions. Um, I hope that we're starting to see um, that there are parts of our community who are starting to learn that lesson as well. Um, there is a, a, a freedom of speech in this country, obviously, but your freedom of speech ends at someone else's nose. As soon as it hurts somebody else, I think you need to stop, especially when, you're, when it's hurting someone who you are supposed to consider family. That's how I see it. Um, how people refer to themselves, that's fine. If you want to call yourself something, you please go right ahead. How you refer to other people, that's another issue. Um, and and I think we've, se we've learned this lesson um, ma many times. You know, we've learned it in our, you know, with, within our own community a, a few times. You know, we don't, we don't use the F word. We ask people not to use the F word. Um, African Americans have asked not to, b not, to have to not, not to be referred to as the N word. They can call themselves that all they want. They do it in rap music all the time. If that's what they want to do, that's fine. But I don't get that freedom. 
as, as because I'm not a part of that community. Um, so I, I think there is um, there are lessons to be learned from those two examples, but also just um, I, I just want us to love each other a bit a little bit more. Um, and it's not an attack on somebody when you ask when when you tell someone that word offends me. I think people are feeling attacked, and um, it's not an attack. It's some it's new information that you get to process and hopefully do the right thing. And uh, and I think a lot of this comes out of the fact that um, trans issues are are are. Um, part of the national zeitgeist right now. I think there's so much education, so much information about trans people that we've never had before. And it's really coming out of the fact that the trans community is empowered to actually speak up and say, you know what, I don't like that. I didn't, I didn't like it then, but now I feel empowered to say I don't like it. And I want you to respect me enough not to, to, to treat me with the respect that I deserve. Um, so when people say, oh, well, they used to be able to, we used to be able to use that word. Well, nobody was feeling empowered enough to say it was wrong then. Um, and, and so we're all learning something in our, you know, this, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big learning curve. Um, and I hope that the trans community also allows people the time um, and has the patience um, to give people the time to learn the lesson and come around. Um, part of advocacy and activism is continuing to push. I get that. Uh, you know, we've been doing it, I've been doing it my whole life. It's really the responsibility of the advocate and the activist to continue to put the pressure on. But, you know, we all, we always know that it takes a little bit of time. People don't just change automatically. So there is give and take on both sides here. There's the the, the, the give on the LGB side to say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm getting there, I understand that it offends you, I'm gonna get there, I'm learning. And then there's, there's the give on the trans side, which is I'm gonna give you the time to get there and continue to ask you to do better. But it's a hard one and it, it breaks my heart to see it. Bueller. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very impressive. Um, I feel like I've sort of grown up with you, uh, between you and the other people I've been with as well. Um, and I think it's really awesome that you're either visible or that you're informed and you're talking to each other with quality. Um, I think, were you in Christina Aguilera's Blood of Your Life? You know what? I was not. But this is not the first time somebody has asked me. And then I watched the video and I was like, oh, okay, I could see why people would think that was me. No, that is not me. No. No, now I'm here. No, that is not me. Some really great dancer. I'm, I'm a good dancer. I'm not that good. Um, but no, that's not me. I'm not in the Christina Aguilera video. That's what he just asked me. Um, well, I mean, I would be ridiculous if I didn't say that Ricky Vasquez wasn't my favorite. Um, and mainly because, thank you, mainly because without him there, been it, there wouldn't have been anything else. Um, but also because um, he helped, he, it, playing him was very cathartic for me. Um, I was 19, 20 when I was playing him and um, I got to go back in time a bit um, to high school and play, a fi play my 15, 16 year old self um, and heal a lot of those wounds. And I, I left that stuff sitting on that stage. Um, I got to play it out and leave it there and walk away from it. Um, and so it was a healing experience for me. Um, and 
and also it was the first time, right? It was the first time that, that we in the States got to see what it was like, what it is like for um, a young person questioning themselves and taking that journey of self-discovery and self-acceptance. Um, and I'm really, really proud of the way we handled it. Um, we gave him the time and the space to love himself. And I think at the end of those 19 episodes, you really did see him embrace himself and start celebrating himself as opposed to being afraid of what was coming to him. Um, and I'm really proud of that. I feel like we, we empowered a lot of young people. Um, I feel like, and now, you know, when I look back on it 20, you know, 20 years later, I, this is actually, this is the 20th anniversary of, it'll be August was our, was the 20th, it will be the 20th anniversary. And so I think about all of the young people who grew up knowing Ricky Vasquez, who may not have known um, a, a, a gay person at, at their own high school, and he could be that person for them. And so that when they were out in the real world and they met somebody or somebody came out to them, um, they, they didn't feel that this was some alien person, that this was something that, someone that they understood and could accept. Um, do I think that he was like, you know, you know, that he changed a whole generation? No, but I think he helped educate a whole generation of young people and their parents. Um, so I'm proud of that. Um, you know, I was a, I'm, I'm a singer, dancer, actor at heart. That's what I was trained to do. So the fact that I got to be on Broadway and Rent and do that for a year and a half, well, it's almost two years, um, and play that specific role um, is, it's that, that was a dream come true for me. Um, I grew up watching Rita Moreno um, and West Side Story. I would put it on all the time. And, you know, eight shows a week for two years, I got to be Rita Moreno. What boy gets to say that? Um, I'm really proud of what, you know, uh, of Noah's Ark. Um, I think that Noah's Ark, you know, while not perfect, um, was the first time that we saw um, a, a cast of African American and Latino gay men who were well adjusted and educated and successful um, and in love and looking for love and unafraid and and I got to play a doctor who was living with HIV, who was probably the most well-adjusted person in the cast. And I think that message um, is something that we need to see more of, you know, to, to help relieve the stigma of HIV and AIDS in our community. Um, so I'm proud of that. I'm, I, it's like asking me to, to, to choose between my children. It's the very Sophie's choice to me right now. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons why I took the job at GLAD was so that um, you know, I only want to do things that I really love and that I really care about and that I feel like um, I can throw myself into. And um, working at GLAD helped me work directly with studios and networks to ask for more of those kinds of roles um, and also gave me the time and the ability um, to still pay my bills and not take roles that I wasn't in love with, right? I'm very lucky in that sense. Um, and, uh, and also helped me feel useful in the world while I waited for something great to come along. And, um, and now, you know, I get to continue to work at GLAD and somehow I'm gonna be doing this series in the fall. I don't know how I'm gonna do it because I'm gonna be flying back and forth between LA and Atlanta for, for a lot of it, but I'm really excited about, um, about Red Band Society and what's about to come. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lucky boy or old man, depending on how old you are. Um, so what kept me going when I was homeless? Um, well, to be fair, so there, what most people don't know is that my so-called life, we, we made the pilot of my so-called life in 1993, and then we had, we weren't picked up. They, the, the show wasn't picked up for the fall, but they held on to us for a year, and um, so they told us in May, told us in May that we weren't picked up. October, 
they told us that we were going to get picked up for the following year. So I came out to my dad after we knew that we were going to get picked up. So I came out to him in December of that year, so two months after we got the pickup for the series. We didn't start filming until m April. So I lived in my car for like four months. So what kept me going was knowing that I had an end point. So as far as LGBT homeless youth, I was lucky because I knew that there was a day where I was going to be on a TV show and I was going to be getting a check. So all I had to do was get through four months. Um, that's not the case for most, <laughs> that's uh, safe to say, um, LGBT young people who are thrown out of their homes. Uh, it kept me going to know that I was going to be able to tell this story. Um, was it difficult? Absolutely. Um, and most of that, let's be honest, could have been avoided if I didn't have all this Puerto Rican pride, ego that uh, you know didn't allow me to ask for help. Um, I don't recommend it. I don't think you know living in your blue Chevy Sprint should be experienced by anybody. Um, so if there is anybody out there who's going through that and um, is being kicked out of their house, there are there are resources that you can reach out to, and you should. Um, I was dumb, uh, but I also knew that it was going to end. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I just couldn't bring myself to ask for help. That was part of the problem. Yeah, which is why, which is why, going through that series and going, like I said earlier, experiencing a lot of that and leaving it there um, helped heal a lot of my issues around it. Yeah, um, the most controversial and the most divisive. Um, <sighs> I mean, it's that's a really. I mean, it's all controversial. Depend if it, you know, depending on where you are in in the country. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in the South, which is why we're taking on the South in our Southern Stories program. Um, I think there are ways into the South, though, right? There, um, there, there's a lot of work that we can do through sports programs, through um, churches that, that are going to allow us to have these conversations. Um, local media is going to be helpful. Um, divisive is really this, uh, the most divisive issue right now, I honestly think, is the one that I was just talking about earlier. Um, I think the way we the way we talk to each other in our own community, um, n we need to be m much more mindful with each other. Um, we need to be much more empathetic with each other. Um, I also saw something. It was, and it's not just the trans community. I also saw something recently. This conversation. Um, around bisexuality that was also very troubling to me. Um, uh, you know, someone, w it was a back and forth about, oh, you, you're, you're not bi, you know, you're, you sleep with men, so you have to be gay. And the person was like, well, no, I, I actually am attracted to, to men and women. And the person said, well, that's, that doesn't exist. And, and that's so disrespectful and so dismissive. Um, that may not be your experience, but that doesn't mean your experience is everyone else's experience. Um, I really want us to be able to, um, there's, there's so much coming at us from the other side, from our, from our real opponents, that um, I want us to love each other a little bit more within our own community. Because the same people who hate you for being gay are the same people who hate you for being trans. And we have the same enemies. And that's why we're a community. Um, we're fighting against the same foe. Um, and the infighting isn't going to help us get to our end goal. And our end goal is the day when none of that matters anymore. And you can just live your life for who, as who you really are and love the person that you choose um, and be the person that you choose to wake up as. That's 
That's the end goal. Not, you know, I should be allowed to use this word because, because. You can't give me a reason why you should, you, I, that's, the one, that's the thing that gets me crazy. It's like, I, well, why, why, do, why is that word so important to you? Well, because I should be able to say it. That's not a reason. <laughs> um, anyway. Anybody? I think we're good. Thank you so much, honestly, for having me here. And thank you for doing this. Um, and happy Pride.